Hi, my name is Andrew Meyer, and I'm a pediatric ICU doctor here at the University of Texas Health Science Center in San Antonio. I also do research, and I'm going to talk to you a little bit about why I do research and why I think it's so important. When I was a kid, I wanted to go into space. I dreamed of being in that next generation of people helping other people and getting to where we need to go, that edge of discovery. So, you know, I did what every other kid did, and I went to space camp. And I realized that I needed more training. I needed to learn how to be that person I wanted to be. So I went to Berkeley and got a degree in engineering. And this, when I was getting my degree in engineering, I realized I really liked space and machines. What I really enjoyed is finding how those machines and those things were able to help people. So I'm a doctor, but I'm not this type of doctor, which we all recognize as Patch Adams. And I'm not this kind of doctor. I'm the doctor no parent wants to meet. I'm the doctor that when your child comes in, they're at the brink of almost death. And I'm there as the last line of defense. And I do a lot of really amazing things to bring them back. And we do great things. But sometimes we need a lot of help. And one of the things we do to help children is I'm going to tell you a little story about a time where I felt like I had to make an important choice, an important choice in order to save a child's life. When I was a resident, I got called continuously to the NICU in order for a delivery room. And we had a good call for babies that were in distress. One morning was early, it was a Sunday morning. I had been working all night on patients and they called me in to go see a patient. I came in, the baby had already been delivered, but didn't make a cry. This is a very concerning noise because we were worried the baby may have swallowed something and is having trouble breathing. So we got to the, got to the uh, delivery room and we were able to get, see the baby. We realized that we need to put a tube in the baby to help the baby breathe put the tube into the throat, down into the lungs, and help give the baby oxygen so the baby could breathe. As we did this, the baby got pinker. But as I put that tube down, unfortunately, I began to see something underneath that tube that was concerning. And that's called meconium, which is sort of, babies all make poop, just like we. And sometimes when they get born later in life, that poop comes out of their body and gets into their lungs. And as you can see here, there's a healthy baby at the top. There's also a baby at the bottom that seems to be sicker from all that poop that's around the lungs. So what I was concerned with when I saw that poop, which I sucked out as fast as I could, I was worried it got in the lungs and the lungs would get sicker. And what happens here is you see on this side, this baby's healthy and the sacs are full, nice big open airways, getting oxygen to the baby, to the heart, and to the lungs. However, when the poop gets in there, the sacs get inflamed and the lungs get stiff and it's hard to do it. So what we do is we put them on a ventilator, a breathing machine. But ventilators have problems. They can only blow up the lungs so much. They can only do so much. And so sometimes we need to do other things to help these children. This is cardiopulmonary bypass in 1953. Look how big it is. It's a big machine. And what do I mean by cardiopulmonary bypass? I mean a heart-lung machine. This is something that we are able to do heart surgery on little babies, repair them so that they can get stronger and operate on their hearts. But also, when babies' lungs get sick, we sometimes need to take the blood out of their body, put oxygen, put it back in. Now, over the years, this machine's gotten better. See, it's getting smaller and even smaller. But the complications from this machine are still high. And I can tell you that because one of the major complications of the machine is clots or thrombosis. And you can see that here in this child where they've had almost a clotted off arm. Sometimes that go to the brain. But that's not always the case. Sometimes we get a lot of children. In the other picture here, we have children that have survived ECMO and done very well and gone on to great lives. And ECMO is that miniature form of that small cardiopulmonary bypass machine. So what, what is my goal in my research? Well, I want to save more of these and less of these. And I want to improve these devices and improve the systems we use in order to make it better. And I think we're at a time in our lives where this can actually happen. ECMO has only been around about 30 years. But in the last, last 10 years, the last five years, we've had a major resurgence of it. And this is what we've seen in H1N1, a flu so bad, it diseases the lungs, that you cannot get supported with ECMO. This was the past. 800 pounds in order to transport a child on ECMO by military transport in a large, huge commercial liner. And that's now been replaced by 22 pounds on a helicopter. We have improved these devices and the support massively, but the complications have not decreased. One out of 10 children still get a clot when they're on the ECMO circuit. We can save more lives 
adults and children with this technology. It's even more amazing, children and adults who have serious lung disease are now walking around in rehabilitation, getting better towards the ability for them to have a transplant and getting a lung transplant. We can use this device to save so many things, but what we need to do is focus on these complications. That's what my lab does. We investigate, simulate, and do clinical studies on these devices in children and adults in order to determine how to make them better and to save more lives. Because I want to make lives better. This child's alive and happy, and that's wonderful, but it could be this child here. Both have the same condition. And I thank you for your time.